We strive to protect ourselves from frightening superbugs by buying the most potent soaps and antimicrobial gels. We sanitize our homes with a host of cleaning agents. Joining us now to help explore our relationship with cleanliness, here are Catherine Ashenberg, author of The Dirt on Clean. Maureen Anderson, veterinary infection control expert who writes at wormsandgermsblog.com. Good title. Doug Sider, medical director of the Communicable Disease Prevention and Control Division of Public Health Ontario. Peggy Richter, head of the Frederick W. Thompson Anxiety Disorder Center at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And of course, we welcome back U of T professor Colin Furness, the infection control epidemiologist, and happy to welcome everybody around the table. Did you notice when we all met each other what we did? We all shook hands, in spite of the fact that this group must know more about not passing on germs than anybody we've ever had on the program, we all shook hands. We all instantly washed our hands thereafter. You did know you did not. You did not. without a bottle of hand sanitizer in sight. There you go. Colin, just here. Give me a little of this here. Just, that's what we should have been doing. A little fist bump there. Let's start by playing a clip. Watch the monitors here in the studio of one of the world's, of course, uh, hormone epidemiologists. Here's George Carlin from a show he did in 1999 called You Are All Diseased. Roll tape. Where did this sudden fear of germs come from in this country? Have you noticed this? The media constantly running stories about all the latest infections, salmonella, E. coli, hantavirus, bird flu, and, and Americans, are, they panic easily, so now everybody's running around scrubbing this and spraying that and overcooking their food and repeatedly washing their hands, trying to avoid all contact with germs. It's ridiculous, and it goes to ridiculous lengths in prisons. Before they give you a lethal injection, they swab your arm with alcohol. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Well, well, they don't want you to get an infection. <laughs> and you can see their point. Wouldn't want some guy to go to hell and be sick. <laughs> you know, even when he can't say the seven words you can't say on television, he's still really, really funny. <laughs> He was great. Okay, Doug Sider, Public Health Ontario. I mean, he does make a bigger point, which is, are we all being too clean for our own good? There is that thought out there, but if you look at objective evidence, one would say, no, that's not the case. If you look in the home environment, if you look at, for example, food handling practices, if you swab a variety of surfaces, etc., no, I mean, our homes, I would say, are not disinfected. They're certainly not sterilized. There's lots of uh, gaps between what people think is the situation and what reality is. Maureen, what do you think? I think there's a happy medium in terms of being too clean and being not clean enough and I think there's probably a very small number of people who are actually at the the too clean extreme uh, but like Doug was saying a lot of us don't realize the areas that we should focus on more perhaps so we're obsessed with for example scrubbing our bathrooms but we're not looking in the kitchen where we're handling raw meat and there's <laughs> contamination all over the place and that's where things are going into our mouths like where are the higher risk areas that we should really be focusing on I have Peggy a relative whom I really hope is not watching the program right now because I'm about to out her <laughs> every time I went into her house go wash your hands shoes off wash hands do we need to be doing that no <laughs> <laughs> but 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 about one in forty of us, two and a half percent of the population, do have obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a disorder characterized very commonly by excessive worries and concerns about dirt and germs, amongst other symptoms. So Steve, it's not uncommon for people to call themselves germaphobes and, and jokingly, you know, re refer to it that way. But it is a disease. It's a disorder, and it's a distortion in perception of the dangerousness of the germs. So if I were a little more courageous and a little blunter. I should say to her, get over your OCD, and I'm not washing my hands. If only that worked, I wouldn't need to be in business. <laughs> <laughs> right on. How about it? You've got the, uh, you've got the, the dirt on clean in your book. Um, do you think we're all a little too obsessed with germs right now? Well, um, my book is about the body. So, and I suppose we should distinguish between uh, healthy cleanliness for health and cleanliness for social acceptability. Yes, I think we're North Americans are too clean in both cases. Too clean because? Because we're washing ourselves and showering ourselves as if we are manual workers who have to walk five miles to the fields and work in the fields all day and have no labor-saving devices, when in reality we are pretty much the tools of advertisers for soap and deodorant and all these things. And for health, I think if you, we've never needed to wash 
less beyond our wrists. I'm totally okay with the hand washing thing, mm -hmm. but we've never needed to wash less above the wrists, and we've never washed them more. Catherine, do you want us to go back to the days where Louis the Fourteenth had two <laughs> baths in his entire life? No, that was one extreme. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the halcyon think, days of cholera, typhoid, <laughs> dysentery. Right. But I think there's a happy medium. Mm -hmm. There's a happy medium. Yeah. Okay, and we we're look far for that. from it. Uh, Colin, I'm going to give you the first shot at responding to this next clip. Once again, the great epidemiologist, George Carlin. Roll tape. When I was a little boy in New York City in the 1940s, we swam in the Hudson River, and it was filled with raw sewage, okay? We swam in raw sewage, you know, to cool off. <laughs> and at that time, the big fear was polio. Thousands of kids died from polio every year. But you know something? In my neighborhood, no one ever got polio. No one ever. You know why? Because we swam in raw sewage. <laughs> It strengthened our immune systems. The polio never had a prayer. We were tempered in raw <laughs> <laughs> uh, Okay, so he did get one of his words uh, you can't say on television, sort of on the air there. Uh, is that pound of dirt actually good for you, scientifically speaking? There's opinions divided on that, but the evidence tends to say more or less yes, uh, that the immune system does need, does need a certain amount of training. And I think the most important thing to remember is that there's a whole ecology around us. Every surface here is covered in bacteria. You probably have about a trillion bacteria all over the outside of your body. And when we do cleaning, we tend to be, it, it tends to be selective. We tend to mess with that ecology and mess with that balance. And that's where things, that's where things tend to go awry. That those bacteria on your skin are mostly really protective because they keep uh, worse strains away from you. What's the hygiene hypothesis? The hygiene hypothesis is that because we are too clean, uh, we are in fact not training our immune systems as we're, as, we're, as we're growing and developing, and that leads to autoimmune diseases such as uh, asthma, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, other a whole range of allergies and so on and so forth. And there's some evidence that there are more, there's a higher incidence of those diseases than in, de say, developing countries with less hand hygiene, but the evidence is actually not that clear. What does Public Health Ontario say about that? I don't know that we have an official position, but I guess my own personal position looking at the literature is I, it's certainly an attractive hypothesis. I think, as Colin noted, however, when you try to line up, are there consistent data uh, that can support this? I think there's lots of holes in the theory, uh, the temporal rise in asthma, atopic diseases, et cetera, doesn't fit well with a lot of societal changes, especially around water treatment, sewage handling, food uh, production processes that have really markedly decreased uh, exposure at individual family community levels to a whole array of pathogens that were hugely problematic and causes of severe disease and mortality at the turn of the century, the last century, and into the, the, the 20th century. So so, I mean, there's those issues. I think there's a bit of cherry picking of data to try to support the hypothesis. But when you look at it, we're not too clean. I, get, I guess I get back to the point that I make. If you look at the environment that we live in, that we work in, that we go to school in, that we raise children in, in terms of childcare uh, facilities, no, there's no evidence that we're disinfecting, sterilizing these environments to the extent that almost the urban myth of excessive cleanliness would suggest is the case. On the other hand, Maureen, you know, we hear it all the time. If you don't expose your kids to germs when they're young, they mm -hmm. won't develop the immunities and they'll be sicker when they're older. Uh, take pets, for example. Is it good yeah. to have exposure to pets when you're a little kid? Well, there's a lot of other benefits to having exposure to pets beyond <laughs> the germs that they may carry and may <laughs> expose you to. And I always say, uh, like, we, we need the bacteria that we live with that are in and on our bodies. So we don't want to live in a sterile environment, but I always say you have to choose your dirt wisely. <laughs> so you have to choose what you're being exposed to and how much of it you're being exposed to. So, you know, having a pet in the house that your kids can interact with and, and pet and play with and that sort of thing is great. Having the dog slobber on your face and having that really super high risk contact all the time, especially with very young children under the age of five, that's something that I would draw the line on because that becomes too high a risk. So. Really? So no kissing dog or cat? What about pigs? <laughs> <laughs> what about pigs? <laughs> if they wash their hooves. If they, if they wash their hooves. No, the, the mouths of dogs and cats, uh, there's a, an urban myth out there that you know you should let your dog lick your cuts and stuff if you, if you have a wound, because that's what they do with their own wounds to, to clean them out. Mm -hmm. But the mouths of dogs and cats carry so many bacteria. It's a, just a 
absolutely laden um, part of the body, and that's why cat bites, for example, are so prone to becoming infected, and you can get very serious infections from animal bites because they carry those bacteria in their mouths. So a dog can lick its wound out because it's licking and physically removing dirt and that sort of thing from the wound, and that will help clean it, but if you've already got a fairly clean cut on your arm, that dog's just putting more bacteria into it. It's not helping you. Catherine, you got pets? No, I don't, but I think this, to me, this is the $64 question. How do you distinguish between the good germs yeah. and the bad mm -hmm. germs? That mm -hmm. is not, you know, because society seems to be divided between people who are so afraid of germs, they bring their own straps to use on the subway, uh, mm -hmm. and then people with the hygiene hypothesis, which I also find a very attractive mm -hmm. hypothesis, who says, yeah, the more germs, the better. The more you live on a farm, the better. The more older brothers you have, the better. They have this profile of the child most likely to benefit from the hygiene hypothesis. It includes dirty older brothers, pets, farm life, daycare, <laughs> other dirty situations. But how do we know? That's, that's what I would like to know. Which, where are the good germs and where are the bad germs? Hmm. Can you help us on that one? Ooh, how would I summarize? I, I think we know a lot about what the bad germs are, and we mm -hmm. see that. And what's interesting, Steve, is that we, over the past decade or more, we've got really increasingly refined uh, analytic tools that can really help us understand environments much better. So we can understand that what we used to think was fairly innocuous, uh, certain respiratory viruses, etc. We can identify them more rapidly. We see how they cause respiratory outbreaks in child care facilities, in long-term care facilities, in hospitals, etc. So I think it's a shifting understanding that the more that we can identify the organisms and follow them closely, I think at times we find that there's more bad than there's good. But to get back to a point that Colin made around, again, some aspects of the hygiene hypothesis that I find attractive. There are certainly good organisms. When we talk about the microbiome, the, 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 basically the microbio, uh, the microbiological uh, ecosystem that, that, that is part of our bodies, I mean, very clear, there's very good organisms to have in your gut that help with nutrition, protect against infections, overgrowth of potentially uh, uh, dangerous bacteria, etc. So as we understand the complexity, we can start to identify, well, this is better than that. And we can also look at some nutritional, breastfeeding, other measures that can promote uh, the, the, the existence of good bacteria in some instances and ward off things that are more problematic, especially something like Clostridium difficile. Uh, Peggy, when you're dealing with people who've got an obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, what, what's the germ of choice that they're always trying to get rid of? Is there something you know, like that that they're constantly in fear of? No, but unfortunately, Doug Sider's people do their job too well, so they read all the publicity now about washing your hands, and my patients take it too much to heart. And they'll say, see, see, I'm not supposed to touch anything. Uh, everything is potentially dangerous. So it could be flu, it could be SARS, it could be Ebola, it could be cholera, it could be uh, the, the great unknown, actually, for many of them. I don't mean this facetiously, because obviously yeah. it's a real thing, but, but how many times a day, for example, give us an example. Patients of mine wash their hands X number of times a day. They shower X number of times a day. What's the X? Huge range, but I've seen people with hand washes up to several hundred times a day whose skin is severely damaged. I've been in one home where they were using so much Lysol, there was literally a dusting of dried bleach powder on every surface. So at the upper end, it's horrible. I just want to point out, though, that OCD is not just about dirt and germs, right? Sure. But that is a common presentation, and they range tremendously. And they'll see the damage they're inflicting on their hands, too, but feel unable to stop, and that's the tragedy of the illness. Mm. I just Go wanted ahead. to make a comment on what uh, Doug was saying about the microbiome is becoming more and more important. And instead of just looking at single bacteria and calling a bacteria bad or calling a bacteria good, mm -hmm. we're learning more and more that it's actually the balance of bacteria in a particular environment. So that's why some people can be carrying a particular bug and it doesn't cause them any harm, but you put that same bug into another person and they can become very, very sick. And that's just something we're getting into. We used to always focus on, you know, single agent diseases and you know this bacteria causes this disease and this bacteria causes this disease but we're learning more and more that it's actually the balance of the bacteria and that microbiome on whatever surface or, or organ you're talking about that's really becoming important. Colin let me ask you about one of the great theories of science which I no doubt I mean you must have studied this at some point in your epidemiological career and any parent knows about this as well the five second rule 
which is um, <laughs> the five second rule, namely you can drop some food on the floor, on the ground, on a sewer grate, anywhere, but as long as you pick it up within five seconds, it's okay to eat. Yeah. True or false? Well, see, I wish I was OCD. It, it, <laughs> is, it, is, it is false, and in my house, it's a 10-second rule. Uh, <laughs> there, there actually was a study done fairly recently. Bacteria don't walk around, so it's not like they're, they're on your kitchen floor and they can't wait to come running over. Um, they either stick right away or they don't, so it's a, it is, it's a zero-second rule. In my, it's house, a zero it's, in my house, it's whether you can get to it before the cats do. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't kiss those cats, just for no, the record. No. no, you never do. And in my group, I model treatment, including the 30-second rule, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so really, that's a zero-second rule? Yeah. You either land on that mm -hmm. bacteria and it sticks or not. Mm -hmm. did, boy, it'd be good to know, wouldn't it? Be good to know if there was bacteria where it landed. Because I think you can assume there is, and then the question <laughs> is, what is it, right? And and yes. this idea of ecology, I mean, I think this is this is we're, we're, we're really agreeing on this. Bacteria, when they're in the right place, like gut bacteria in your gut, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, the so-called fecal oral route of contamination uh, leads to gut bacteria going into your mouth uh, that used to be in your gut, and those innocuous bacteria can cause horrible horrible problems that way. Mm -hmm. This is very disappointing news because I I would have hoped <laughs> that. If you drop a Smarty, I mean, the Smarty's got that kind of shiny shell on it, right? So nothing can stick to that, right? I'd be with you on that, but uh, you're, taking, you're taking your chances. <laughs> enough, <laughs> enough Smarties and something bad might happen. But I'd like to be contentious because I think yeah. the point is that while there is risk, we have to balance the risk. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us see so much publicity about the danger of, of germs and dirt in the environment that we go too far. So while those risks are indubitably there, mm -hmm. They're pretty minor for most of us. I not agree. I agree completely. And the problem is the balance between the behaviors we go to to try and avoid those dirt and germs mm. and the real risk they mm. represent, which is small. Catherine, what is the germiest, is that a real word? It is yeah. now. Oh, I'd accept it. What is the germiest <laughs> object you can think of? I think it's the bathroom sink. Because? It's, it's a guess. Well, because it's always moist, and mo moist is germs like moist. Germs like moist. Yeah. Okay. Much, I think it's much more germy than the toilet. Okay. Mm -hmm. This conversation is <laughs> rapidly going to descend, I'm sure, as we <laughs> consider this question, but we need to know. Maureen, what's the germiest object you can think of? I would say it's the sponge yeah. in your kitchen yeah. sink, yeah. because it's almost impossible to clean it properly it comes in contact with all of your dirty dishes all of the the things you're cleaning that may have had you know the raw chicken and the raw meat on them things that you know sat out on the counter for hours to days depending on who you are can be growing all kinds of things and then you're scrubbing them off with this sponge and yeah there's a little bit of soap in there but even antibacterial soap is not going to clean that sponge entirely. And we touch it all the time. And we touch it all the time. And it's also the last thing that touches the dishes that we then are going to eat off hmm. of afterwards. <laughs> OK. Doug, germiest thing you can think of? I probably agree with agree on that one. Marine, yes. Peggy? Absolutely. In fact, I think I've seen studies about yes. this. Mm -hmm. yep. And that and, and dishcloths. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I would go with bathroom sponge, loofah sponge, because bathrooms tend to be more humid environments. And in the oh. human environment, bacteria can go from one to a billion you know, overnight. So none just just on humidity, I might go back to the bathroom. And actually, none of you gave the answer that I thought I would hear, cell which phones? is cell phones. I thought we'd get. I thought we'd get buttons on an elevator, and I thought we'd get the the. I don't know what you call it, the, the latch on a tray on an airplane mm. when you're, because oh. everybody's touching that and they it's never clean that stuff. You can find contamination on these surfaces mm -hmm. without a doubt, but the magnitude and the diversity, mm -hmm. I'd go to kitchen. And what's going to be on that surface, yes. right? So yeah. bathroom, you know, people just use the bathroom and then they're using the sink and touching faucets right. and that sort of thing. In the kitchen, you've got food safety and food um, contamination issues and that sort of thing. The latch on the airplane, yeah, everybody touches it, but mm -hmm. what are they likely to have on their hands when they touch that? Yes, they could have cold and flu viruses and yeah. that sort of thing, but mm -hmm. you're not yeah. as likely to have salmonella, C. difficile, and yep. all the really nasty ones. Gotcha. Colin, again, forgive me on this one. We're really sort of getting gross here. <laughs> Kids pick their noses and eat it. Yeah. Is wait, that? Wait a minute, we didn't hear the answer. What? Oh, no, no, I was asking you. I don't have an answer. No, I don't have an answer. I thought it was a skill testing no, question. No, 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 I was asking. Oh, okay. It's a hit parade so, of me. things Absolutely. to think about. No, no, yes. it's a top. It's a majority position. <laughs> right. Exactly, okay. top ten list. I, I think we got it now. Okay, but back to the pick and nose and eat it. Is that harmful? 
Um, well, it's gross. I think you, you, gross, you nailed yes. it right there. Um, your nose and your mouth are, are more or less part of the same biome, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. you do get Staphylococcus aureus living in the nose. Uh, it, it really does like to hang out there. Uh, some of us probably have that in, in, in us right now, mm -hmm. uh, but the, nothing much happens in the gut there. They produce a toxin if they really reproduce, so food, uh, there's a bad food poisoning you can get from that, but you're not going to get that from your nose. So it's, it's gross but not unsafe. Mm. Gross but not unsafe. I, I would can I would you um, want to contest that? Yes, contest <laughs> that because it's not what you're taking from your nose and put it in your mouth that's the issue. It's what's on your finger sure. when you stick it in your nose and then stick it in your mouth. <laughs> I almost washed my hands before. Before you, <laughs> before you, oh, that's excellent. Then you're you're good. Thank but you. yeah, kids, kids aren't. Kids are probably even worse than adults at washing their hands, right? And they got all yeah. kinds of stuff on their hands. And the key thing is they're then sticking it into their mouth. So yeah. it's not the nose part. It's so the it's finger into it. So it's just stick your finger in your oh, mouth. Yeah. Forget the nose. Yeah, yeah but right. nose secretions and that they're gluten-free, they're <laughs> trans fat-free. So, I mean, there are some benefits. I've always so wondered why, why a kid would ever want to do that. And I've had kids who wanted to do that. But they all do. I don't get the impulse. <laughs> I know. It's do. very deep. Evolutionary. Is there a Impulsive thing there, or it is. That in fact, in, in our new diagnostic Bible, there's a whole category for what we call body focused repetitive behaviors. Hmm. And these encompass a whole range of things. So, the ones that are officially diagnosable now with OCD are things like compulsive hair pulling or trichotillomania and skin picking. But then there's a range of other behaviors nose picking, hair twirling, nail biting, thumb sucking. And some people would argue that they, they are evolutionarily conserved, that to some extent some of these automatic behaviors served a very helpful function in survival. You know, survival eons function? ago. Well, grooming and cleaning oneself and taking care of oneself in a repetitive way okay. could be useful. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Of all the dignified, important subjects we've <laughs> talked about on this program over the thousands of programs we've done, we've now talked about picking your nose and eating it. So I think that's probably at the it's probably time to change the subject oh, is what it's probably say, time to do. It's actually a very natural behavior in certain yeah. other species like cows, for example. Mm -hmm. Part of their normal behavior is you will see them actually stick their tongue into their nose and keep it clean. No, but that's part of them keeping their, their face and their nose clean. It was that's a great exactly topic like for a Seinfeld yeah. episode as well. So we, we, may hear, we, we may hear from Jerry before the program is over, just giving you a heads up. <laughs> Catherine, the expression, so clean you can eat it off the floor. Where's that come from? I don't know, but I would guess it's something that l from like Dutch cleanser or some period in those 1910s, 1920s when advertising and soap made an unholy marriage and uh, so left us all with these touchstones. But that's the thing. I, mean, I, I guess it refers to a time when people took such pride or care with how clean the floor was. Absolutely. We don't live in that world anymore, do we? Well, some, some people do. Some people do. do. Yeah, mm -hmm. some people do. Is that OCD if you want to be mopping your floor three, four, five times a day? Could be. Can be. Could be. With some of my, yeah. I had one person who couldn't tolerate a single leaf on her lawn, so she'd be out in the fall raking <laughs> ten times a day. You know, anything that ruined the perfect appearance. Mm -hmm. Is there, Maureen, an, for lack of a better expression, an unholy marriage between advertising, products, and our compulsion to be clean? I think uh, one, of, one of the issues we have with things that are advertised commercially is everything is now antibacterial this, antibacterial that. Mm. And, and yeah. I think it's actually, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg, but mm. a lot of it is consumer driven, right? Everybody has become obsessed with this idea of I need to have antibacterial soap and antibacterial this and antibacterial that. And if you go out and try to find non-antibacterial soap mm -hmm. in the store, it's actually really hard. Can't I've, do it anymore. I, I've looked, it's there. And the thing is when you're cleaning, particularly in the home environment where you're not, say, in a hospital where you've got these bigger, nastier mm -hmm. bugs, 90 plus percent of the what you want to do is actually the cleaning part and all you need is the soap. You don't need that antibacterial component, right? You're just trying to, you know, you'll knock down the bacteria on that surface by 90, 95, 98% just, just by using soap. just using plain soap because yeah. it's a mechanical action that yeah. just removes the dirt from the surface and most mm -hmm. of the bacteria will go with that. Yeah. The antibacterial components are something you need in a higher risk environment like a hospital or a clinic. Hmm. Yeah. So we're, okay. we're still it's it's these these antibacterial products actually are strength training for bacteria. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're you're actually making you're actually making the situation worse. I, I couldn't agree more. Soap actually removes stuff. That's what it that's what it does. And if you're if you're doing improper washing or an incomplete washing with antibacterial agents 
you're, you're actually selecting stronger bacteria. And some of the difficulty is there's very, there's much less stringency around health-related claims that can be made related to consumer products than with health products. And so what people don't realize is that if you start to read the fine print on many of these products, you recognize that there's limited coverage of the types of organisms. But then the concentration, how well the concentration maintains itself if you've got that product for months mm -hmm. with periodic yeah. use, etc. And then there's a really key issue, which is contact time. And most people don't appreciate that. They think a quick wipe over a surface after you've cleaned it, that there will be instantaneous and effective antimicrobial action. And that's not the case. Usually, the vast majority of disinfectants need a specified concentration applied, usually in a wet form, for a minimum contact time. And most often, we don't practice that type of hygiene. In the, certainly in the home environment, we're getting much better at recognizing the time, the contact time uh, dynamics in the healthcare environment. So there's just a whole bunch of misinformation and a lot of it can't be corrected because of the power of advertising. Well, that's what I want to pick up yes. on. Go so, for it. Well, I think it is advertising driven, having learned a little bit about how advertising made us buy soaps, deodorants, Listerine, et cetera, et cetera, with this thing that's called whisper advertising or fear advertising. You know, are you offending mm -hmm. people without knowing it? or? are you always a bridesmaid but never a bride, which was the great <laughs> slogan of Listerine. And some, at, some, at some point in the late 1990s, there were 700 new antibacterial products introduced into the market with, with as you say, less than stringent um, standards for sure. But to me, this is just, this is advertising. Mm -hmm. Meaning they are trying to put some kind of fear in us that we're yeah. breaking a social code and that we need some kind of product to fix it. Breaking a social code in the case of, um, you know, soap stuff and deodorants, but breaking some kind of health code in the, in the forms huh. of germs. And, you know, those were years when SARS and MRSA mm -hmm. and a lot mm -hmm. of bad things were happening. Yeah. And hmm. Boy, it took people a long time to believe in the germ theory, but when they really got it around the 1920s, they've just gone. I'm sure that's where So Clean You Can Eat Off the Floor comes out of that period when all of a sudden, after decades of resisting the germ theory, all of a sudden it was in the public realm and it was a field day for advertisers. Germ theory being? The germ theory being what we've all been talking about, that we're surrounded by all these tiny little critters many of whom are good for us and some of whom are bad some for us. Some of which are bad. Are there, Maureen, again, getting back to the fact that you don't like to kiss your cats, uh, are there are there sort of good pets and bad pets if you're afraid of germs? There are definitely pets that are considered, again, higher risk. So uh, people don't realize that, for example, young puppies and kittens that are so cute and everybody wants to cuddle them and kiss them and hold them up to their face and that sort of thing, those are actually, among dogs and cats, sort of the more biohazardous versions because they're younger, <laughs> they tend to carry more parasites, they're more likely to shed certain bacteria in their feces, that sort of thing. But when you want to talk about really high risk pets, it's it's more uh, sort of exotics like uh, lizards and reptiles who almost universally carry salmonella and people don't realize that. Mm. Baby poultry that are often a very popular gift around occasions like Easter and they're given to very young children again as a learning educational experience or they'll have them in classrooms so that children can sort of watch them grow up. But those are higher risk species for different kinds of bacteria and they're also pets that we don't understand their behavior so exotics. Uh, really exotic animals that we don't understand how to uh, respond to their cues that they're giving us, more likely to end up with bites and scratches and that sort of thing. And again, kittens and puppies, they're not trained, their behaviors aren't set, mm -hmm. more likely to even nip out of wanting to play. Mm -hmm. And yes. that can lead to breaks in the skin and then people get infections, bite infections and so on and so forth. So. Hamsters, guinea pigs, gerbils, yes or no? There are certain there are certain bacteria and viruses that they can carry. They're relatively low risk in that they're they're fairly well contained, depending on how you manage them though. Mm -hmm. And if they're handled properly, they can be excellent pets. But again, you have to have somebody who's responsible enough to handle them correctly and to manage them properly and not let them, you know, run around the child's room and poop in whatever corner they want <laughs> kind of thing. Which which they sometimes, they sometimes do. Sometimes do. Right. Peggy, again, back to OCD. Do people who suffer from this condition, condition, is that what you call it? Mm -hmm. Do people who suffer from this condition feel safer and more confident inside the home as opposed to outside the home as they deal with this situation? 
I think that's part of the problem for many of them because they want their home environment to be this ideally perfectly safe environment, but they can never achieve it. And that's part of the disorder, Steve, is that it's not about reality. It's about this internal feeling that it's wrong, that it's incomplete. And so they may end up in some sad cases restricted to really one chair in one corner of the living room that feels safe and the rest of the home feels so hopelessly contaminated, it'll never be clean enough. How, I mean, if somebody suffers from that kind of condition, how do you get them out of it? So there are two kinds of treatment that we know work. Uh, neither are cures. We don't have a cure, but both have pretty good results. So one is medications, antidepressant medications actually, which can work for about two thirds, three quarters of people who go on them to some extent, certainly reduce the symptoms. The even more effective treatment though is a form of psychotherapy we call cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. where we look at identifying maladaptive or problematic thinking around the dangerousness of germs, for example, in the case of contamination. And we learn to challenge it behaviorally. So we have them go out and practice touching doorknobs and I'm sorry guys that we then have them share a bag of potato chips around the table in my group or bring in brownies because we're trying to break down some of the excessive fear they've developed. So sometimes I am talking to them about the fact that there are small risks, but most of us take on those small risks very comfortably daily. Shall we do the uh, potato chip clip right now <laughs> since you mentioned it? <laughs> have we got that standing by, Sheldon? Segue. Okay, Jerry Seinfeld, take it away, roll tape. Double dip that chip? Excuse me? You double dipped the chip! Double dipped? What, what, what are you talking about? You dipped the chip, you took a bite, and you dipped again. <laughs> so? That's like putting your whole mouth right in the dip! <laughs> Look, from now on, when you take a chip, just take one dip and end it! <laughs> Catherine, double dipping. Double. Not good? Well, I prefer not to do it. You prefer no double but dipping. I, but I have sometimes turned the chip around and used the unbitten oh. ch side to get the second thing because who wants to eat the whole chip without the dip on it? Is there really an epidemiological reason not to double dip? I don't know. It seems <laughs> it's, it's, we're, we're it's right in there about risk, right? Yeah. What is, what, what's appropriate? I mean, yeah, I've been no, known I'm to flip it. the carrot, and like, like flipping, yeah. flipping the chip. Um, it's, it's trying to find a balance of what's, what's reasonable behavior. That's, that's yeah. a tough one. That, that's a tough one. I can understand why people watching would be grossed out by it, right? <laughs> so it may just be the psychological, psychosocial environment is such that you shouldn't do it, which is different from the actual bacterial risk. But it's a good question for the holiday season because yes, we're all going to be seeing mm -hmm. that. Yes, exactly. Yes. Or had being any, tempted to do it. Before that episode aired, <laughs> did any, I mean, had anybody heard of double dipping? Was this a thing before that episode aired? I don't know. I, I don't remember that ever being a thing. But you see, my clientele would, be, would have been worried before the first dip because yeah. who knows who put it in the bowl yeah. and where their uh, hands were. Yes, so, right. you know, there's an endless chain of possible contamination yeah. anyway. Boy. It's complicated out there, isn't it? <laughs> it's very complicated out there. All right, let's go back to uh, I, uh, an expression that we hear all the time, Catherine, and uh, you refer to in their, in their book, cleanliness being next to godliness. Where does that yes. come from? Well, this comes from uh, John Wesley, the founder of, of Methodism, and in 1791, he, it was, it's a phrase in the Hebrew Bible, and he adapted it, and it came out in English, cleanliness is next to godliness, a phrase beloved by mothers and school teachers <laughs> ever since, thinking he, that he was referring to a clean body. He wasn't at all. Like the 18th century and centuries before, clean bodies were pff, of no interest or importance. It was clothes that Mr. Wesley was talking about. Oh, he just wanted people to have clean clothes. He just clothes. wanted people to have clean clothes because clean bodies involved way too much risk because they involved warm water, which was thought to cause the open your pores so that the plague could get in hmm. more easily. This left us with, um, after the Black Death came and a third of Europeans died, the, the King of France asked the faculty of the, medical faculty of the Sorbonne, what's going on and how can we prevent this? And the medical doctors said, uh, don't be too fat, don't be too excitable, and don't ever put your body in warm water because your pores will open and the disease will enter. Hmm. And this started what the French historian 
Jules Michelet called a thousand years without a bath. <laughs> Actually, it was only about 400 years without a bath. But, but, but that's why King Louis didn't take baths? That's why King Louis and everybody else didn't take baths. And actually, it was tragic advice because the flea that, that moved the plague from person to person was attracted to sweat. Mm -hmm. So the dirtier you were, the more likely mm -hmm. you were to die. But As you've looked, say, at the last thousand years, what was the low point in terms of the cleanliness of society? In the West, uh, for sure, the 17th century is the dirtiest century of all these gorgeously arrayed people in their cut velvets and their ruffs and their wigs. Underneath were bodies that never saw water. And uh, well, Lu Louis XIV lived mm -hmm. a long time, was super athletic. Um, in the morning, his washing was dabbling his fingers in a little wine. Uh, and he was thought to be very, very clean by the French because he changed his linen shirt four times a day. And mm -hmm. that, they believed, was cleaning that was safer than getting into water. Huh. And they cherished the ring around the collar and the ring around your wrist because they thought that was a sign that the flax plants in linen had drawn out your dirt and you were now clean. Isn't that so that ring around the collar thing actually... They thought it was great. It's a real yeah. thing. Yeah, it's a I real thing. I forget what product that is. That's terrible that it's... Probably something like Tide or one yeah. of those. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. Ring around the collar. Uh, should we do one more? Um, should we do one more Jerry Seinfeld here, just for fun? Uh, okay. What the heck? Elaine, take it away, please. Peggy, we've got to talk. What is it about me that you find so offensive? You seem to be with a lot of men. What? I happen to have a very steady boyfriend. <laughs> you know, I mean we broke up a few times and there has been an occasional guy here or there, but I'm, what, why is this your business? It's not. Good day. Oh, all right. You think I've got germs? I'll give you some germs. How about some for your keyboard, huh? How about that? Oh, how about for your stapler? Hmm? That's good, isn't it? You have a happy and a healthy. Uh, okay, Maureen, are we a little too over the top when it comes to cleanliness? Like I said, I think there's a happy medium. To me, it's all about the, the risk benefit. So there are certain behaviors that will carry an increased risk of, you know, transmitting bacteria every time we shake hands, for example. But that's an important social thing that we do that's part of our culture. Uh, for example, with pets, a lot of people feel it's very important to, for example, sleep with their pets. They want their pet in their bed with them, mm -hmm. and that's a really important social thing for them to have. And yes, there might be some increased risk because you have a pet right there and you're very close to them, and it's that kind of very close contact. But to most people, the increase in risk is probably very minimal compared to the benefit that they'll get mm -hmm. from that. So it all depends. Too judgmental when it comes to germs? I don't think so, and I guess a point I'd like to bring up is that there's also a bit of a sense of almost a romanticized ideal about how we live our lives, etc. I, I think if we look at socioeconomic factors, for example, Steve, and see the gradients that infectious disease, admits, asthma, etc., really anchors you know, on poor socioeconomic status. And that can be due to factors such as income, it can be due to the adequacy of housing, uh, situations where you live, what you're exposed to, the environment, etc. So I think we're, we're almost looking at a romanticized vision of human behavior, whereas the reality is much more diverse and problematic like that. I, I guess a, a, a very uh, egregious example is the conditions of many First Nations, you know, where due to substandard housing, inadequate housing, Housing, crowding, uh, oftentimes persistent problems with access to potable water. You've got a huge range of basic, at times devastating, infectious diseases, necrotizing fasciitis, complications such as this, that are occurring at a much higher frequency in those communities because of a lack of the basic preconditions to for environmental hygiene, safe water, cleanliness, etc. So I think part of the, the, the romantic image needs to be counterposed with the reality of many communities' populations where, God, they would love to have the wherewithal, you know, to have the opportunity to uh, clean surfaces, environments, have access to clean, potable right. running water. Just in the last few minutes here, th there was a day when everybody always either shook hands or a kiss on each cheek or, uh, you know, whatever. Fewer people do that now, it seems to me. 
A lot more air kissing than real kissing. The occasional fist bump as opposed to shaking hands. I think even when people sneeze now, they, they used to sneeze all over their hands and then shake hands, and now they, they do it into their... So it's not impossible, I guess, Catherine, eh, for mm -hmm. cultures to, to change over the decades what's considered acceptable. Oh, my gosh. They, they do nothing but change over... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the list of every culture in the 28th centuries that I studied called itself clean. They all thought they absolutely had it right and that other cultures had it totally wrong, but it's it's all over the map. And it, and there's no straight line of progress. It took us something like 150 years, say 1800 to 1950, fretting, struggling, bath, shower, no, soap, yes, da da da, to get back to what the Romans had done two, two hmm. millennia before. So hmm. we are very, very malleable and uh, susceptible as a as a species, I think. Colin, do we want to see a day where people don't shake hands anymore? I think it would be a good idea. I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic. I, I have less of a historical perspective. I'm less optimistic people will stop shaking hands because it's such an ingrained habit. But 80% of all infections are from touch. And that's, that's a really high number. The flu kills five or 6,000 Canadians a year. That's a big number. <laughs> so it's, it's worse than just the sniffles. Uh, it's, um, it, it is a serious thing. And I, I, I'd love, but I shake hands. I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I can't not did. shake hands because not. when did. someone does this, you have to, yeah, yeah, you have to answer back or, or, or it's, it's rude and you can't sort of be doing this right after either. Do you so know what's funny though? When I met you in the green room before the program began, I walked up to you and I purposely didn't stick my hand out to shake your hand to meet you as I would normally because <laughs> yeah. I figured you won't do that. But you did. It. I did. Yeah, I'm not a germaphobe. I, I, I kind of, I kind of wish I was at times. Uh, but I've managed to stay fairly healthy, so I think perhaps I've got the balance right. Good enough. Uh, let's be careful out there, everyone, as they used to say on Hill Street Blues. Okay, <laughs> stay away from that double dipping, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Maureen Anderson. You can read more at WormsAndGermsBlog.com. Catherine Ashenberg, the author of The Dirt on Clean. Doug Sider from Public Health Ontario. Peggy Richter from Sunnybrook. Colin Furness from Infonaut and the University of Toronto. Great to have you all with us tonight here on TVO. Thanks, Steve. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.